Thank, Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, as mentioned, I'm Wendy Zellner. I'm a researcher. I'm a research plant physiologist with the USDA Agriculture Research Services. I'm stationed out of Toledo, Ohio, so I'm born and raised Northwest Ohio. And what I'm here today to talk to you is about silicon, which is the next will be the next essential element. So starting off, how many people have heard of silicon? Maybe not in reference to plants, but just in everyday. So what silicon is, it's actually an element. It's the second most available in the soil. So it's everywhere around us. We actually come into silicon every single day of our lives. Um, it's in our water, it's in our food, it's in fertilizers, pesticides, it's in the soil, it's in cosmetics, electronics, um, silicone is a form of silica. And so there's this overabundance of silicon that we live in and that we have all evolved in. Silicon is an essential nutrient for humans, for animals, and it is an essential plant nutrient. It hasn't been recognized yet as essential due to the abundance. And here in the United States, we have had more than enough silicon in our cropping system that we haven't seen deficiency symptoms yet for um, the powers that be to upgrade silicon from beneficial to an essential element. But that's where my research comes in. And so today, what I'd like to just share with you is some background information on silicon. I'm gonna try and keep the science as down and out of it as possible, but please interrupt at any time if you have questions and we can go into this a little further. So when we think of silicon as a plant nutrient, so your plants are constantly taking silicon out of the growing environment, just like all your other nitrogen, nutrients, your nitrogen, your phosphate. And if we look at how much is being removed here in the United States, on average, we're taking out 28.7 pounds of silicon per acre. And that might not seem like a lot, but if you look at corn, so when you grow corn here in Michigan, you're removing 67.6 pounds of silicon per acre. Wheat, 44.4, .4, potato, 37, barley, 25.4, oat, 22.1, and soybean, 2.6. And now these numbers might seem low, but this is just based on your production weights. If you're removing more plant material out of the field, these numbers are gonna jump up much higher. And so it's this constant removal of silicon out of your cropping system without putting it back that we're starting to see issues. And so when we're thinking about silicon, we know it's everywhere. The soils have a lot of silicon, but unfortunately, it's not all plant available. A very small amount is in the form that plants can take up. And so when we think about silicon, usually the first pe thing people think about is sand. And unfortunately, sand, it does have a lot of silicon, but it's in an unavailable form. So it's in this crystalline form that's depicted here, and it's a highly structured form. It's really hard to break down. So if you think of the silicon in sand, it's like, a reinforced concrete block. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of energy to break that down into smaller subunits. Amorphous silicon, on the other hand, this is a form when living organisms take up silicon and deposit it in their cells. Um, instead of being in this highly crystalline form, it's a more relaxed form, so it breaks down a lot more easily. So it doesn't take as much time or effort to release these single subunits, which are referred to as silicic acid. Silicic acid is your plant available form. So when you start thinking of silicon as a plant nutrient, you wanna know in your cropping system how much silicic acid you have available to those plants. And so plants actually take the silicic acid up through the roots and transport it to the leaves of the plants. And they've actually broken plants up into three different categories. You have high silicon accumulators, that, and this is all based on how much silicon is up in the leaves. So when they started classifying plants, they just looked at leaf tissue. So your high accumulators are your grass species, your grains, so your corn, your wheat, your barley, rice. And what's interesting about these plants is they take silicon up like a straw. They suck it up out of the soil solution into the roots and just keep shipping it up into the leaves. And they take up anywhere from one to 10% silicon on dry, dry weight. So that's 1,000 to 10,000 parts per million of silicon is taken up by these plants. Your intermediate accumulators are in between your high and your low. And so they take up between 0.1 and 1% or 1,000 to 10,000 parts per million silicon. 
And these are your legumes, your barley, um, your soybeans, and some of your other dicots. And what's interesting is they still take up the same amount of silicon from that soil solution, but they regulate how much goes up into the chute. So they don't keep pumping it up like your high accumulators do, but they still have the same transport mechanism that's in these high accumulators. And at an even more extreme end are your low accumulators. So these are plants that the leaf levels are less than 0.1% dry weight matter. And um, tobacco is what I use as a model system. Some of the tomato varieties fall into this and some of the dicots are lower accumulators. Again, they still take the silicon up in the roots, but the amount that's shipped up to the leaves are much lower. And so here, all plants have the ability to take silicon out of the solution as silicic acid and move it into the shoots. They just regulate how they move that silicon based on the type of plant that you have. So when we think of how plants use silicon, they use it both physically and physiologically. So physically is best understood because it's easy to see, especially in our high accumulators. As they keep shipping that silicon up, what they actually do is they deposit it in the leaves and the stems of the plant. And that's what gives the extra strength with silicon to these plants, which in wheat can resist lodging. It helps reduce transpiration. And so if you can see here some scanning electron micrographs, um, you see silicon deposition around the walls of these silica cells. And that's, it's referred to as biosilicification. And so in your higher accumulators that continually take it up, they actually have these specialized cells in the leaves. Your intermediate and your lower accumulators don't tend to have as many of these specialized cells, and that's why they don't need to keep shipping it up during developmental stages. It's also deposited around the trichome or the leaf hairs of the plants. Um, and then the physiological part is the less well understood, and that's really where I've been working on in the low accumulators. And so the one main thing that silicon does as an, a defense, um, it increases tolerance to stress in plants. And there's this effect called priming. And what priming is, when you feed a plant silicon and it comes into contact with an environmental stress or disease, it can respond much more rapidly than plants that weren't fed silicon. So they're primed and ready to go and that's why silicon has such a beneficial effect on stress tolerance in plants. We also know that there's changes in gene expression. And so that tells us silicon isn't just being taken up and deposited and that's the end of the story. It's doing much more internally in the plant. And that's one reason why silicon is a beneficial and an essential plant nutrient. Um, so as I mentioned, stress tolerance is the number one um, positive benefit of silicon that you'll see the most, especially if you have deficient um, plants and you start feeding them silicon. Um, it's just like other plant nutrients. It's important for maintaining that health. So it's not going to take care of all the problems. It's not going to take care of all the disease, but it's going to give you that healthier plant that can fight off disease and stress. And so here's just a couple examples. Here's a corn plant under drought stress. And so this one is fed with silicon and this one isn't. And you see the thicker, larger leaves um, compared to the non-silicon treated. And then here in response to a pathogen, these are rice leaves with a fungal disease, rice blast. And you see, as I mentioned, that priming effect, you see very small little pinpoints of necrosis or those darker lesions. And what this is showing that this leaf responded much more quickly to that infection. It can stop that infection and keep it from spreading and it actually kills the fungal hyphae. Whereas when it wasn't fed silicon, you have much more chlorosis and larger lesions. And so what we're starting to learn, um, one of the reasons looking at foliar tissue, a lot of researchers had said only the high accumulators need it because the lower accumulators don't have a lot of silicon in their leaves, so they just kind of passively take it up. We started looking further into this, and what we found is the roots in these lower accumulators actually are where a lot of the silicon is needed in these plants. And so here, um, I work in a greenhouse production lab, so these are more of our uh, greenhouse plants that we work with. Zinnia are our high accumulators, so these would be comparative to your corn and your wheat. 
if you look, the green is the foliar tissue, which they have very high foliar tissue, and then the root tissue is less than the leaf tissue. When we moved into tomato and we looked at the amount of tomato that's in the leaf versus in the roots, we found extremely high levels of silicon in the roots of certain varieties of tomato and lower amounts in the leaves. And then over here, pepper and tobacco are in the same family as tomato. And again, they have very low levels in the leaves, but they still have a decent amount of silicon in the roots. So what this means is even though we, we've been basing all of our information on the foliar tissue, there's a lot more going on underground. And by understanding this, this is why we're starting this transition into understanding that silicon is essential for plants. And so it's really important especially with stress tolerance, to think of silicon as an essential nutrient. Um, one other thing that we're learning is that there's specific times in development that these plants need the silicic acid available to them. And so in the um, developmental stages of rice, and probably true for wheat as well, when the rice go into the grain filling stage, instead of the silicon being shipped up into the flag leaves, it's moved into the pentacles and it actually goes into the hull surrounding the grain. Um, in tomato, they know that silicon is needed at the first bud stage. So as soon as your fruit set starts, it's important for um, the number of fruits, the seed uh, morphology, and the pollen fertility. So silicon is important for uh, the reproductive stages of the plant so far from what we're learning. Um, but this is just developmental. We also know when we come into disease, you need that available silicon at the time of your disease or your stress. So here in tobacco, um, and it's, I apologize, it's hard to see, you can come up and look later. When we didn't give the plants uh, silicon, this is tobacco ring spot virus. So this is a viral infection. The symptoms on this leaf cover almost the entire leaf. When we fed plants silicon, they had very small lesions and they also had more necrosis, meaning that they were responding and killing those virus particles more efficiently than the control. What was more interesting when we looked at the levels of silicon in plants that were infected with tobacco ring spot virus versus plants that weren't, we had a significant increase in the amount of uptake of silicon out of the solution. So what this tells us is that under stress, plants turn on their uptake mechanism and they need that silicon continually shipped up during stress events to have these beneficial effects. And so that means that you need to make sure, unless you know when a stress is gonna happen, which is really hard to predict, you know, with the different environmental stresses and disease, you wanna have some type of available silicic acid at the right concentration in your cropping system for the plants to take advantage of this nutrient. Um, that's all I have for slides. So what you need to think about um, when you start thinking about silicon as an essential nutrient, what are your levels in your cropping system? How are your plants responding to that? And then when you start looking, there's a number of different products that are available to you. You have both liquids and solids. Liquids are great for a quick fix. So Liquids are usually applied to the leaves, but when silicon moves up through a plant, it's traveling through the xylem, which means that it's an immobile element. So once it gets into the leaf, it's not going to remobilize out of that leaf and move up in the plant. So one of the disadvantages of foliar spray, even though you can get a quick response because going from the root, it's going to take longer for uptake, you have to keep reapplying it as you have new stress and the plants grow out of that because they'll deposit it as needed. One of the nice things of having it down in the soil solution is you can't add too much. You won't have the toxicity effect because the plant will regulate how much silicon it's gonna take up. And if it doesn't need silicon, it will downregulate transporters and it will only allow for a certain amount to move up into the leaf. Um, so with that, there are a number of products that you can do um, incorporation into soils. You can do field dressings, foliar applications. Um, they come from a lot of different sources. There's mined rocks, there's volcanic rocks, um, there's recycled slags and other recycled glass material that all are these new products that are coming out or that have been out that they're realizing why they were working is because they were providing silicon before we really understood what silicon was. Oh, do you want to step in and 
pick up where I left off. I'm John Zunis. I'm Director of Technical Services for Plant Tough. I think one of the issues is we started doing field trials in the Michigan area probably about seven or eight years ago. And one of the startups, as we came up and we talked to people a lot, like Wendy said, uh, silicon essentially goes back to people look at it with aged soils. Uh, Brazil uses a lot with their sugar cane and such. The soil is in absolutely horrible condition. In other areas like that, that's really where they've seen a lot of benefit. It hasn't been used here because the people in the Midwest essentially looked at it. We're good. We don't have any silicon deficiencies. It's not a big deal. So, you know, we're fine. Well, we've been doing trials for, like I said, seven or eight years, and we've seen positive responses on every trial. And so the plants are taking it up. We can measure. We do see the differentials. And I think probably one of the biggest areas, as Wendy said, is the stress situation. And that all the work we've done is when the plant undergoes stress, you see dramatic differences. And I think probably the biggest one that I've ever seen was in central Indiana a couple of years ago when we had the drought come through. We had a farmer out there who just did a small patch for a trial. He wanted to see how it worked on his corn crop and went merrily on his way. The drought hit. He ended up, he chopped the whole thing. He ended up going to silage. Uh, it never really matured or anything, but we were able to go back in afterwards and take a look at the patch that we had put in versus the rest of the field. And the differential for silicon in that potential case was the root ball on the treated material was like this. The root ball on the stuff that wasn't treated was like this. It ended up, we see the drought conditions, we see the severe stress conditions. Plants have a better tendency to survive. You know, it's not saying they'll survive all the time. If you get a bad enough situation, you know, nothing's going to help you. But for some of those where you're kind of in the middle, where you may lose a normal crop, it can be that advantage you need to go ahead and carry forward. The other side with some of these products that what you'll see is they're not just silicon. Uh, the product that we particularly deal with, we have a calcium component, the magnesium component, and the manganese component in it. So there are other nutrients that are coming along with the SI, and they work in synergy to go ahead and, and help the plant. And with all of those, same thing. We see positive response on uptake, so you know it's been a pretty good adjustment. In many cases with ours, ours is essentially, it, with that calcium component, it adds a pH component to the material, and typically instead of using an ag lime, you would use something like this. It'll give you the same performance as an ag lime. It'll take care of any adjustments that you would be looking at with the ag lime, but it provides the nutrients and it provides SI.